Welcome to Oh God, What Now? I'm Ros Taylor. In this week's show, we're talking about what the Rwanda judgment means for asylum seekers and the Tories. Will defeat in the Supreme Court energise the right of the party or are their glory days over? We try to understand the apparently enduring appeal of David Cameron and whether the rest of the reshuffle will do anything to make the Conservatives more electable. And in the extra bit, we talk satire, deep fakes and the dangers of making impersonation illegal. Let's meet the panel. First up, it's commentator Alex Andreu. Hello, Alex. Hello. You went on Sky News this week and you talked about homelessness. Uh, Suella Braverman said last week she wanted to confiscate homeless people's tents. Does her exit mean that that's dead on arrival? Yes. And I think it was, as it turns out, from the timing of what was going on behind the scenes, like when we know Sunak was first contacted uh, Hague, then Cameron, uh, it turns out it was actually that that did for her. It was at that point that her seal, the, her seal was fated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Her fate was sealed. Yeah, her fate was sealed. <laughs> um, and, um, and I find that rather jolly, actually, that she made her lifestyle choice and we made ours. And now she's politically homeless, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because, you know, it was just a, a really shitty thing to say. You know, as someone who's, who's experienced homelessness for a stretch of time, including a bit of rough, rough sleeping, um, the psychological effect of people moving you on or, you know, defensive architecture, how it's called, those spikes and stuff like that, you know, the psychological effect of a city that tells you, no, not even this bit of pavement for you is devastating, absolutely devastating. And so it's not something that anyone should be advocating, let alone a Home Office secretary. Indeed. Matt Green is a comedian whose first national tour is fast approaching. Hello, Matt. Hello, how are you doing? I'm good. We'd love to hear your David Cameron impersonation. <laughs> Can we hear that? Well, luckily for me, I don't really do impersonations because otherwise I feel like the last few years of politics would have been even more stressful than they have been already. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to learn all these new impersonations and then every few minutes, oh, I've got to do a new... I've got a friend um, um, who... Um, Noreen Skinner, who's a very funny comedian, and she um, does a brilliant Liz Truss impression and sort of looks quite a lot like Liz Truss. And so for a few weeks there, she was like, this is it, this is my new career. <laughs> <laughs> and then she stopped doing that and then she started doing Nadine Doris and then she was off, so um, yeah, she keeps destroying people's careers. Um, but it, it, it's, it's been such an extraordinary week. David Cameron back in the cabinet. Michael Howard, I heard on the Today programme today. I yep. just feel like I'm waiting for Ian Duncan Smith to appear on Strictly. Um, <laughs> William Hague to pop up in the jungle. It just feels like you know all the old characters from my sort of early days of paying attention to politics are sort of back in the news. Um, and the David Cameron thing, I just... I don't know. It just, I've been watching a lot of cricket as well the last few weeks, and it does feel like it's sort of like the England cricket team have had a really bad World Cup, and it's like they've decided to recall Ian Botham, uh, who is, you know, who's <laughs> also a lord. Who's also a lord. Exactly. He's already in the lord. So, you know, he's 67, but I'm sure he'll be fine. Sure, he'll be fine. It's tragic, isn't it? Because they were doing so well this summer. Yes. And then, you know, the now they're just throwing it all away. That's, that's how it's different to the government. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Completing the panel is the artist formerly known as the secret Tory, Henry Morris. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Ros. <laughs> you're living in Wales now and you're learning Welsh. What's that like? Um, living in Wales is brilliant. I, um, it's, it's very different. Coming back to London reminds me how different it is. I spend my weekends getting fallen trees out of rivers with my chainsaw to stop the house <laughs> flooding and getting my neighbour's goats off the woods next to us. And... Yeah, learning Welsh. Is that for a job, as a hobby? That's just for sort of, that's the sort of stuff that takes up your spare time when dies goats get out and come into your woodland. Um, and my daughter's a, a, um, a my daughter's a fluent Welsh speaker now at five years old, going to a, a Welsh medium school. So trying to keep pace with her because all the all the other parents there speak Welsh. So trying to talk to people at uh, swimming lessons has helped if I can speak the language they're speaking. Can you give us a bit of Welsh for our listeners? Depends what you want me to say. Um, <laughs> um, I can even credit Bordney of in and all uh, on Dunani. <laughs> um, I, I didn't think you'd ask me back, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> very good. That's very good. Yeah. Um, before we start, a little podcast news. Our partner podcast about geopolitics, Doomsday Watch, is back for a brand new series with a brand new name and a brand new presenter. 
The new title for the series is This Is Not A Drill, and oh God what now regular Gavin Esler will be hosting a brand new weekly show about the corruption, rivalries, disinformation, climate change and raw realpolitik that are taking our world to the brink. The first episode, 12 Months to Save US Democracy, is out now on all apps. Just follow the link in the show notes or visit thisisnotadrill.co.uk to listen and subscribe. First off this week, the Supreme Court has ruled that the plan to send asylum seekers to Rwanda, where that country would decide whether to take them, is unlawful. The chances of a plane taking off before the next election are, according to the lawyer Adam Wagner, pretty much zero. We'd love to know what Nigel Farage thinks of all this, but sadly, he's sweating in 40 degree heat in Australia for I'm a celeb, and he can't tell us. Alex, first things first, why did the justices find this unlawful? Um, so this was the third a uh, round of legal knockabout on this policy, basically. The High Court found it unlawful. Uh, sorry, the, yes, the High Court found it unlawful. It was appealed appeal to the Court of Appeal. That was a split judgment. One of the justices thought it was lawful. And so it went up to the Supreme Court. And this was now the definitive judgment on the matter, unless the government decided to appeal to the ECHR, which would just make me pee myself with <laughs> laughter. Um, they won't do that. Um, and it was a five justice panel and it was a unanimous decision. It was a much quicker decision than, than expected. And I'm saying all this because it is important, because everyone thought maybe it'll be a fudge. Uh, they will say the scheme is fine, but not Rwanda right now. Um, you know, maybe it'll be a split decision. Basically, that some sort of hope would be dangled the government's way. And it just wasn't. It was a crushing verdict from uh, the court. Um, with Justice Reed making a point of listing all the, uh, the reasons why it was unlawful and making sure it was understood that this was not just down to the European Court of Human Rights, the European Convention of Human Rights, I should say, but it was down to several domestic laws and down to several other international conventions to do with the rights of refugees, to do with the, the uh, rights against torture, to do with uh, uh, international conventions and trafficking. So basically, the signal he was giving to the government is, if you think that leaving the ECHR will solve this issue for you, it won't. You will basically just have to leave the planet, leave the international legal system in full. Um, the, the core of the judgment is this uh, principle against non-refoulement. Um, which stems from very old French laws of war, basically, that meant if a serf was trying to, was between the two lines of army advancing and was trying to get behind the lines, because it's like this has nothing to do with me, gov, you weren't allowed to refouler, to push them back into the action, as it were, into the war zone. Um, and so what is important to, to say is that... Um, Non-refoulement is considered by most legal scholars to be what is known as a, as a jus cogens, um, which is a, a peremptory norm of international law. It's something that you can't amend in some ways or interpret in some ways or curtail in some ways or circumvent in some ways. It's basically an axiomatic value that all parties to international law accept and you cannot move from. Um, and so I think the anchoring of the decision in that is, it means basically the Rwanda scheme is dead. So fundamentally, this is about not being able to trust Rwanda not to um, send people back to their countries of origin, isn't it? Mm. Yes. And um, considering the, the circumstances that the judge is listed, even though they left the door open, they said, of course, there is some point 
in the future where maybe things would move in a way that would allow us to think of this as something that could happen, which is something judges always do in a matter of policy because they don't like to tell the government you can never do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not doable. The government's response has been to say we'll upgrade this memorandum of understanding into a treaty so that it has more um, legal force. But, you know, considering one of the judges' reasons for saying no to this was that the rule of law in Rwanda is not respected habitually and there are things like extrajudicial killings and people disappearing in the middle of the night and people being deported without due process. I'm not sure that a treaty would suddenly make them think, oh, that means all of that is all right. And it's also significant that it was the UNHCR that was the primary evidential contributor to the court. They're the people that gave them the evidence. And what the court said is, look, we looked at what you say, we looked at what Rwanda says, and then we looked at what this what they actually international yeah. organization that we all belong to says, mm. and we decided that we kind of believe them. And Lord Reid made the point too, but there's been a big mis misunderstanding about this scheme, which the government has quietly encouraged, I think, that when we send people to Rwanda, if we do, they will, Rwanda will be deciding whether they can stay in the UK or rather go back to the yeah. UK because by that time they Absolutely. will be in Rwanda. But that, of course, is not the, not it, the case at it, all, is it? Everyone who go, Nobody who goes to Rwanda will ever have the right to claim asylum in the UK. No, they will be considered for asylum in Rwanda. And so the judge's very first comment was to say... This isn't an offshore processing scheme. Mm. This is a scheme that basically farms out our international responsibility to refugees to another country. That's what it does. It doesn't farm out the processing of those claims. And what does the government do? Immediately after the decision, they put out a statement that refers to it as a processing scheme. So, <clears throat> I mean, either they truly thick and they don't understand the policy they've been pursuing for the last two years or they are deliberately engaging in misleading the public. Suella Braverman has, uh, well, people uh, close to Suella Braverman apparently <laughs> said today that <laughs> she... Who are those people <laughs> and how much therapy do they need? <laughs> well, they were saying that she apparently argued that um, it should be a scheme whereby people would have the right to claim uh, asylum in the UK. But uh, uh, Sunat went against that, which is something I hadn't heard before. Yeah, weird, right? So, <laughs> Odd, she, yeah. so she thinks people should go there and presumably if they're accepted, then they come back. But if they're not accepted, then they get sent back. So we're outsourcing. And does Rwanda do it on their rules, on our rules? Are we saying Rwanda is better at processing basically our backlog? Is that... Is that what we're well, paying 140 faster, million <laughs> for? Because I can tell you, 140 million will buy you a lot of fucking civil servants to do this stuff here. Well, you know, I'm pretty sure that Rwanda would do it faster than we are, <laughs> <laughs> if without any kind of morals or due process. Um, but Rishi Sunak, as you say, says he will pursue the plan anyway. He'll make a, make a new treaty with Rwanda, and he oh, will make it, darling. He will make changes to domestic <laughs> law if necessary. <laughs> Um, how will that work? And will he have time to do all that before the next election? No, but but that is rather the point, isn't it? Because, you know, flying 500 people out of a backlog of 175,000 to another country won't do much for you. But being able to say, oh, damn, those <laughs> blasted lawyers, even if, if they just let me do it, it would all be solved. That does something for you politically, right? So mm. the the point is to play for time. Yeah. And to play for time, not just with voters, but significantly with his own backbenchers, to say, you know, like a teenager, mum, I'm doing it. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and, and that's, what, that's what's been going on for the last three years, essentially. 
And there is now a clear line with Labour, actually, because Starmer was very damning about the verdict today. And you can be quite sure that uh, the Labour Party wouldn't try to push this through now the Supreme Court has rejected it, whereas they were at least nominally, nominally in, you know, supporting the Rwanda scheme before. So that's another thing that's happened. No today. one can push it through. Yeah. I mean, you know, unless you're one of those loons on his back benches, which includes Simon Clark, weirdly, he's very suddenly yeah. he's suddenly drunk a Kool Aid, um, and you know, unless you're one of those people that just goes, oh, fly them off anyway. It's like I mean, <laughs> which is what Lee Anderson was saying. Yeah, yeah. 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 It, well, yeah. you were saying fly them back to Rwanda. It's like they didn't come from Rwanda. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they um, came from abroad, Alex. Yes, and, and as, <laughs> as James cleverly, James cleverly, I thought it was good today. He mm. he sort of resisted all those calls quite admirably and was saying, "Look, we're not gonna, we're not just gonna drop out of the international legal framework mm. um, because there are implications to that." big implications when it comes to business. And that's an aspect that no one talks about. If you drop out of the international legal framework, suddenly you have a big contract law problem. And for the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland. Yeah. yeah. Henry, many Tory MPs are furious, furious today. Have they started blaming the judges? They're always furious. <laughs> um, I think the, the way Alex has just wonderfully elucidated everything that's just happened is such a stark contrast to how these backbenchers operate who exist in a very simple world where what they say is right and they can't think around a problem. And I, I sincerely doubt that they would understand anything we've just been talking about, really, in, in the meat of the issue. Um, but then, yeah, I've, I've, following on Twitter as I was coming in on the train, we had Ben Bradley saying that um, the, the judges have misjudged the public mood as if the job of the judiciary is to, as a sort of PR officer, is to sort of sense which way things are going and then go with it, preempt that. Um, Lee Anderson, like we were talking about, just send, send, them, send them straight over there, just put them on planes. I'm sure he'd be willing to volunteer to do that himself. Um, and they exist in a sort of nirvana where everything's so simple, like it, it, nothing's a problem because it's just the answer is, is there in front of you. And Brendan Clark Smith was saying, what was he saying? That, um, that they, oh, he retweeted the enough is enough. Um, no, um, enemies, enemies of the people, people. enemies of the people, of the people yeah. um, oh. referencing the judges. Oh, for God's sake. Of, and then immediately when it was pointed out that this was a bit, you know, a bit off, saying I wasn't having a go at judges, I was just having a go about how they've, they've got everything wrong here. But it's, it's so, I, yeah, it's just so simple for them. They're, they're not very bright people. And the, the solu some of them clearly think the solution to their problems is flying 500 people at a time to Rwanda. Um, and leave the other 139,500 behind to not get processed. And some of them know that they're just gaming this for political leverage and time. Mm. But it's, um, yeah, it's sickening. <laughs> and actually, there is, a, there is an interesting uh, point there because the, the calling back to this enemies of the people thing, which was all about Lady Hale mm. and the decision about the, the unlawful prorogation of parliament, um, Lord Reed is a very different judge to Lady Hale. Lady Hale is quite an activist um, uh, judge. Yeah. Lord Reed is the opposite. He's an extremely conservative, small c conservative judge that has never sort of wandered into area of policy. And that's in essence, why he was there, because after Lady Hale and that la backlash from the newspapers, they thought, we better put someone in place. So what I'm trying to say, I guess, is that if you can't get this decision through under Lord Justice Reid, you ain't going to get it through hmm. anyone. It, yeah. it feels to me that there has been slightly less attacking of the judges this time than there was perhaps in the past. That mm. That I've noticed that several times, I think Sunak said it, and I think even Bravman said it in a tweet that came out quite recently, that, that I'm not blaming the judges. It's not their fault. Mm. It's the law's fault. And that's because Parliament hasn't done the right thing with the laws yet. And I so, fought the law. You know, and so it's like, hang on, but you are the one who put those laws into place. So it's obviously, it's still confusing, but it does feel to me like they have slightly backed off the kind of attacking the lawyers, attacking the mm. judges thing, because I think that has that hasn't worked and has shown them to be, uh, has made people think that they're being very unreasonable and, and over the top. And it feels like perhaps Cleverly is doing that as well, is sort of trying to reduce the temperature of it and say, yeah, okay, we accept that, but we're now going to do this. Mm. And 
the question is whether they, I mean, I'm just looking at what Sunak's saying in this press conference, and he's saying that they will introduce emergency legislation to Parliament to confirm that Rwanda is safe, which is basically what, <laughs> yeah. that's what Boris Johnson said in his Daily Mail yeah, article I mean, yesterday. He's basically saying we're we're going to tell you it's safe regardless of whether the law whether the courts agree with you that it's safe. It's such a bizarre. It's such a bizarre idea that you can just say but to the courts, no, it is safe, it is it's, safe. That's your starting point, saying yeah. we have to prove it's safe. It's, it's, yeah. it's back in, you know, full Brexit, um, you know, extreme sovereignty territory, though, isn't it? Yeah. It's the oh, idea yeah. the idea that, you know, if we could only set all our own laws and ignore everybody else's, then it would all be OK. This is all so familiar from that Brexit playbook. Yes, but there's more than that going on because this is also not about, uh, you know, at least with Brexit, the sovereignty was theoretical. They wanted to give it back to Parliament. Now we're talking really about a very specific authoritarian executive mm. that wants yeah. all the power. Mm. That's very different, right? So when Simon Clark comes out and basically says, if a government wants to do something, has a policy, and, this, and the human rights framework, framework won't allow it, it's the human rights framework that must change, not the policy, mm. okay? So what he's saying is that a government in place with 40-odd percent of a vote that didn't have the Rwanda scheme in its manifesto, by the way, or any mention of boat crossings, nothing, their only reference to us, the asylum system in the entire manifesto is that we will continue to provide, you know, help and mm. um, protection to those who apply mm. for asylum. That's literally the only sentence devoted to it. And so to turn around and say that when that group of people want to do something, fuck the rule of law, fuck the courts, fuck due process, that takes you in a whole other area where the F word begins to um, materialize, and I don't mean fuck, I mean fascism, mm. um, because that's what they're saying. They're saying we don't understand separation of powers. We mm. don't recognize it. A an executive that's in Downing Street, even if it's two prime ministers removed from the person that actually went to the people, they should be allowed to do whatever they want. And it still goes back to Brexit, doesn't it? Because particularly Absolutely. with, with Braverman, her uh, incredibly in, uh, uh, aggressive letter to Rishi Sunak yesterday about goes back to Brexit. Yeah, so that's this where is, the mandate this comes This is where from. the mandate comes yeah. from. It's yeah. like, well, but no, the mandate was to leave the European Union. Yeah. We have done that. That's done. I don't remember a, a box no. there that said... You know, also, I would quite like to victimize trans people yeah. with. I also want to get rid impunity. of the human rights framework yeah. out of. Yeah. Matt, in all this analysis of whether it's illegal, have we actually paid enough attention to whether this plan is remotely workable? Um, I don't think we should, because, because <laughs> I don't think not. it. Because, well, A, because it's not, and I don't think it was ever meant to be. I think it's it's clearly not workable in the sense of that it's not going to make a massive material difference to the numbers of people we're talking about. As Henry said, there's a huge, you know, um, huge backlog. And even if they end up, you know, in the best case scenario from the government's point of view, it'll be a few hundred, maybe a few thousand people over a few years. That won't have a huge material effect. What they're saying is it will have a deterrent effect. But I don't, I don't know. I, it feels like there's no evidence of that. And it feels like that's based on wishful thinking. And if the deterrent effect... The deterrent effect, I think, would have to be, it would have to be so bad. And that's where the deterrent effect has always been confusing, because they've always, they've always tried to play both games of saying, really, if people come here, they're going to get sent to Rwanda, and they won't want that. <laughs> yeah. They won't want that, so they won't come. But on the other hand, Rwanda's great, and Rwanda's a brilliant place to go, yeah. and people love Rwanda, and Rwanda's safe, and it's pretty... So hang on, you can't have both ways. It can't be a deterrent and a good and, thing. And if they, Rwanda does deport them back to the countries they came from, as the Supreme Court suggests they almost certainly would... These guys are going to try again, aren't they? Exactly, yeah. Uh, depending on which country it is and depending on, obviously, the, the legal situation over there, yeah. It, it, it just feels like it was always an incoherent policy. And it's now, it like with many things, it feels like the government kind of never really wanted it to happen. Um, but they're going to keep pretending they did because 
they think it's a vote winner. So do you think this is, you know, actually a relief to Sunak? Because renegotiating a treaty, no, no matter what he says, takes a bit of time. Mm. And is he, or is he actually, is he a believer? Is he determined to press ahead with this as fast as he can? I don't know. I mean, I think, I think he's going to certainly say that. And this seems to be what he's saying in his press conference. And he's going to keep banging the drum and say, we are going to introduce emergency legislation. But James Cleverley's statement was fairly emollient today. It was fairly, we are not going to breach international law. We're not going to, um, uh, Jonathan Gullis asked him, so yes or no, will you leave the ECHR? And, uh, and he said, I don't think that that's necessary. You know, then, then we need to do that. So I think they are, they're definitely taking a step back from this Braverman approach of let's just smash everything up and and, um, and go for it. There was a funny moment um, in the statement where cleverly said, we will abide by international law, we will not foot forward proposals that create a row for political gain, at, what, at which point <laughs> the Labour benches sort of collapsed in laughter, <laughs> um, because that was the whole point, that was the whole raison d'etre of the policy <laughs> from Suella Braverman, and he's just basically swatted that and said, okay, we're not doing this just for fun, we're not doing this just to make PR. Um, but it, it's going to be tricky for Sunak because he's got himself into a difficult situation. If he backs the policy now, then there's be lots of people saying, well, it's not legally possible. And if he doesn't back it, there's dozens, you know, possibly even as many as 100 or so MPs who are going to try and make trouble for him. So Braverman's now out. She's apparently they're going to drop a grid of shit on them or something. That was some some phrase yeah. I saw, you know, <laughs> they're going to keep drip, dripping, you know, oh, well, he said this and he's done this and he said this and he's done this. So, yeah, I think it's going to be tricky whatever he does. Bring it on, I say. Um, can I say something slightly wider and more serious? So the the derivation of this system of laws to do with refugees comes from a particular time in our history, obviously. But it does also stem in its modern iteration from a really specific incident, you know, the the what's known as the Voyage of the Dam, the, the St. Louis, I think, was was the the ship that left Germany in 1939 with almost a thousand Jews on it and went from port to port to port being refused, reaching as far as Cuba and America and Canada, then turned back to Europe until eventually countries sort of agreed to take a few people each, at which point basically the Nazis retook those countries and all those people ended up back in the death camps. So, you know, there is, it, it's not an abstract piece of legislation is what I'm trying to say. It tries to address a particular thing. And that particular thing means that this British exceptionalism only works if it is exceptionalism, right? If everyone decided to do what we're fucking doing, the world would be fucked in a very real way, right? Because all the refugees would pile into, let's say, Jordan until that collapsed. And no, then all those refugees, including the Jordanians, would pile into Turkey and go up against its western border until that collapsed. And then Greece would go. And you would get just a domino effect of country falling after country. There is a reason. There is a selfish reason that countries got together and said, we're going to share these people out because that's the smart thing to do, actually. Not just the humane and civilized thing to do, but the sensible thing to do. Well, I mean, this isn't particularly interesting because we're not the only country that is now trying to send asylum seekers abroad to have their claims processed. Italy is mm. opening two centres in Albania. And although I think those are for... Processing. Yes, those, those processing centres. Yeah, yeah. And Germany is thinking about doing that too, which is quite a big departure. It hasn't made up its mind yet. Does this ruling today have implications for them? No, because we are talking about processing. And I think, I mean, it, if they want to create a cottage industry, I guess, of some nearby nation mm. handling the intake of refugees, that might actually be beneficial to all involved, I, you know. The, the applications might be sorted out slightly faster because effectively they're doing what the European Union is so good at doing, which is you develop this specialization and you as a country develop this specialization. So someone will basically become an expert in 
you know, uh, processing claims and will um, tie its economic um, uh, prosperity to it. And, and, you know, a country like Albania, this could be a wonderful thing, provided it's properly monitored. Henry, you are or you were the secret Tory. How do you think party members feel about the small boat saga? Are they going to die in a ditch for this? Um, they'll be unhappy about it as well, won't they? But they are um, easily riled up. And I can't help thinking about Nigel Farage, who the irregular arrivals to this country, which prompted all this hysteria that we're finding about small small boat arrivals. Um, as far as I can cast my mind back, started in lockdown when Nigel Farage was sat on cliff tops with his binoculars, That's looking, true. looking out for, for yeah. people arriving, um, and then getting then getting excited about it, seeing that he was making some headway with this, so sitting in his boat and doing it. Um, he's notable by his absence right now off in the Australian jungle. But I mean, the the wider point um, that you just touched on is that these are people we're talking about. And he, my mother-in-law arrived here as a Hungarian Jew child refugee in 1956 after the revolution there. Um, and so my family wouldn't be here now, my, my wife and my children, had she not arrived and been welcomed and made a life for herself. And they came here with nothing. Um, and they, they, they secured a, a living here and they weren't necessarily welcomed everywhere they went, but they weren't sort of treated like political pawns to, to mm. for people to make um, political gains with. And I, I just feel that the, the, the essence of this whole thing, and Labour's not really tackling it as well, in my opinion, is that we should be welcoming, no one's making the moral case for welcoming more people to the country. We're, mm. just, we're just arguing about the technicalities of how many we can accept. They bring things to the country, they improve the country, um, they've clearly crossed continents with very little, so have all the skills that you won't find on the Tory back benches. You know, they're resilient, robust, intelligent, thoughtful people, and they're coming here to aspire to better themselves. So why don't we replace Tory members with asylum seekers? <laughs> <laughs> and they get to love a country, I think, with, yeah. a, with a gratitude and purity of, mm. of um, a spirit that very few indigenous people do in mm. my limited experience. They properly love the country that becomes their home. It feels that chaos is the biggest feature of our lives right now, from Ukraine and the Middle East to the prospect of a Trump presidency. I'm Gavin Esler, and over the past few decades, I've covered some of the biggest news stories which have shaped our world. Now, in a new weekly podcast, I'll be disentangling the threads of a new age of conflict and chaos. The name of this podcast, This Is Not A Drill. Coming soon from the makers of Doomsday Watch, this is not a drill with me, Gavin Esler, and guests. Find it on your favourite podcast player. Now it's back to normal service. The four top offices of government are once again all occupied by privately educated men. Suella Braverman was replaced by James Cleverley and David Cameron is back in the game as Foreign Secretary. Are you not reassured? But first, I want to try to clear up some confusion surrounding the role of Esther McVeigh. According to the... <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> according to the government's website, she's a minister without portfolio. But the Conservative Party announced her as the Minister for Common Sense and said her job would be to fight wokery. Matt, what is her job? Oh, I don't know. I don't think anyone knows, really. I mean, every time I hear that word um, minister without portfolio, it always makes me think sort of gives me a sort of sad image of all the other cabinet ministers have got like their, their sort of black folders in front of them, all their portfolios. And she's sort of sitting at the corner going, can I have something to write on? Again, no, you have no portfolio. You're not allowed a portfolio. And I think, I don't know, I think probably the simplest way to describe it would be she's going to be the minister for GB News. That's kind of what it is. Like she's she's campaigned against all sorts of things. She's campaigning against the banning of buy one, get one free offers. I imagine that would be a hugely important campaign. Um uh, you know, she, it just feels like a PR move. It feels like apparently her job is going to be speaking up for working people. And it feels like basically they brought in an Etonian and made him a lord. And so they're going to have to balance it with a sort of working class GB news presenter as though that somehow works. But she's been in the past very anti LGBTQ+, plus, particularly in education. She's been anti lockdown. She's anti diversity training, um, all the usual kind of anti woke stuff. Um, and it does just feel to me that as usual for this government, 
common sense basically just means sort of lowest common denominator going for sort of base instincts and pointing at people and saying you're not like the rest of us and boo. It feels like the world's most pathetic scraggy sort of bone to throw to the to the right doesn't it? It's, it is quite patronising because she's the only sort of right is sort of more sort of hard right person they've brought into the cabinet and so it does feel like they're going is that all right you get one and it's her is that okay and I don't think it's going to work if that's if that's the political idea that well she's going to balance out you know David Cameron or something I, I just don't think that's going to be in any way effective well enough of the woke finder let's talk about Baron Cameron the new foreign secretary oh, Lord. No, Baron, Alex. Not Lord. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's going to be Baron. <laughs> there is a Lord yes. Cameron already. Baron. Yes. <laughs> Baron Cameron. Baron, Baron Blue Cameron. Baron. The Blue Baron. <laughs> Henry, did this appointment take you by surprise? Um. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And Come no. on, don't pretend. <laughs> the, re the return of the Etonian spam javelin <laughs> is is so. Yeah. Yes and no. I've, I've, I was taken by surprise. I mean, I thought actually, no, that's exactly the sort of predictable nonsense they come up with to keep everyone talking. It reminded me of Harold. Do you remember Neighbours? Harold Bishop Dis <laughs> disappeared in completely bizarre circumstances, <laughs> and all that was left were his glasses on a rock. And then he returned. <laughs> he returned eight years later with very convenient amnesia mm -hmm. and swanned back into Ramsey Street as if nothing had happened. And, and laser surgery. <laughs> and laser surgery, <laughs> exactly, yeah. And it's, we've reached the sort of stage of hackneyed plot lines where you, in, in, the, in the franchise, in the series, where yeah, you, nobody's that surprised, are they? So why has he come back? Because William Hague was reportedly <laughs> the first choice for the job, but he turned it down. And, um, you know, he seemed pretty content to sit back and uh, rake in the money since 2016. He's well, rattling around the shepherd's hut. He's getting too small for him. He's, he didn't get invited on I'm a Celebrity. <laughs> He's waiting for that invite to come in. I have no idea. I mean, it, the redemption, the, it, it says a lot about the uh, patriarchy and our entitlement and the this, this sort of the, the racket that it is in this country that he gets to wreck the country like he did and get another go. And that's just that's just how things are. The fact, yeah, the fact he's been invited back really is extraordinary, considering the mess he left behind. But we're like, yeah, just have another go, mate. Alex Cameron says he's given up all his other jobs to focus on this one. All that's of them. That's nice of him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But remarkably, we don't know exactly what those were, as the Foreign <laughs> Office hasn't disclosed them. Um, we do, though, know this. He got into very hot water over the green sill scandal. Now, this is complicated, but can you run us through briefly what happened there? Because I think it's important to, to remind ourselves of what he was up to then. Yes. Um, I mean, this is a very potted version. There is a full bunker that I did on this, and I would advise people to go and seek it out. Um, so Greensill was a company that did supply finance, okay? This is a thing banks do for very big companies where basically you provide the goods and the, the bank will pay you the money straight away instead of you waiting 90 days for an invoice to be paid. And then the, the company that's receiving the goods will pay the bank. There's not much profit in it. They do it as a service. Greensill came along and said, I can do this for everyone, big and small companies, disrupt basically the system. Everyone went marvelous, democratizes um, the, the financing system and basically um, make, makes the movement of money around the economy much more efficient. Um, the problem is that because there's not much profit to it, what he started doing on the side is also giving high-risk loans to a lot of those small companies, using the money that was flowing through the company mm -hmm. from Invoice X and Person Y, so not really using their own funds. I think I can see where the problem is. Yes, <laughs> you're, you're beginning to see it. Um, so the moment you basically run out of, if it slows down at any point and you're not getting that money coming through, it's a basically a pyramid scheme. scheme. Mm -hmm. And in a weird little fold of regulation where he set up basically the company in country A, um, ran it from country B, but it sold its goods to countries X, Y, and Z. So no one was like, is, is it, who's regulating these people? <laughs> is it us? Is it one of, it's you, it's Switzerland. No, it's not, it's Germany. No, it's not, it's, it's us, because he's doing the, anyway. So... And then what happened is COVID happened, which meant that flow of money stopped. And 
So he needed to extend the life of this pyramid scheme. He needed access to those COVID loans. And um, Cameron, who worked for him, for the company, as a sort of the Westminster equivalent of an Instagram influencer, I guess. <laughs> you know, someone who goes, oh, I'm using green seal on my, you know, on the green bags sunset. under my eyes. It will do wonders for you, too. Um, so he Take got him my bio. He got him to um, try and open a few doors and and sort of convince a few people that they should make these loans accessible to Greensill. And I'm not talking about one or two texts. I think he sent something like 62 messages to high-ranking ministers, including six to Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, going, oh, please, please, please. Um, and so he was quite harshly criticized for that because the company ba basically went belly up a year later. And everyone was like, Thank God we didn't listen to him because they didn't. No. They didn't give money. That you know, that's the bright, the silver lining to this. Should have got grand shops to do is it. that <laughs> everyone went? Uh, no, thanks, Dave. So, so basically, <laughs> poor judgment of a kind that it's not the first time that we have seen some poor judgment yeah. from David Cameron. Yeah, yeah, really poor judgment for hire. Hmm. which is the, the worst kind of poor judgment, I think. Yeah. Greg Hans has been kicked out as party chairman after <laughs> only nine months. Um, what is the real job description of a Tory party chairman, Henry? What do they actually do? I was thinking about this and I was thinking about how many we've had in the, in the last three years. Lots. And I made some notes because <laughs> we had Jake Berry, who offered pragmatism because he was the person who said right. that um, if you can't afford your bills, get a better job. Right. Perfect. Yeah. The sycophancy of Oliver Dowden, who would say anything and do anything to elevate himself to the appropriate place. He did three, how, much, how long did he do? Nine months. Um, Nadim Zahawi, with his attention for detail, 27 million tax, forgot to put it on the tax return. And heated stables. <laughs> and, and heated stables, <laughs> exactly. We've got a real skill set coming together. Um, ben Elliott, I mentioned him earlier, with um, his golden passports for... Um, Russian oligarchs yeah. and his um, concierge service, getting them concert tickets and things like that. I mean, you'd have to be a real talent to make it to the Conservative Party chairman role. Mm -hmm. And Greg Hans, of course, um, whose defining skill was tweeting a picture, a note from 13 years ago, <laughs> over and over again. So obviously a, a master strategist. Do you, do you have to be a man to be Tory party chairman? Or does it, does <laughs> well, it just the clues help? in the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Self-evident. <laughs> I, I saw um, I saw a description of David Cameron from way back when, um, as um, C-3PO cov covered in a thin layer of ham, and I cannot <laughs> get it out of my head. Let's talk about Suella Braverman's resignation letter to Sunak, um, which was kind of spicy. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. What struck you most about it, Henry? Um, I, I guess the, the, the way a lot of people reacted and saying, I can't believe that um, she made these demands and he gave her this role. And I was kind of, not presumably naively, I don't know, under the assumption that this is the horse trading you do to get a cabinet position. You say, mm. I'll keep quiet about this or I'll do this for you and you give me this job. So um, it, it didn't really sort of, it didn't blow my mind that this sort of stuff have been going on. It was. I didn't think it was very well written, which means presumably means she w wrote it unaided. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I yeah, it's it is what it is, isn't it? She um she she's she said you've got uh, no mandate, and then presume went on to say like we said lots of things, but she didn't have a mandate for that. He didn't help her to do so. Yeah. So um, yeah. So I'm I'm gonna assume you hadn't read Andrea Jenkins's letter no, you before me. that one. <laughs> Because um, if you had, then this letter would seem like <laughs> lake, <laughs> basically. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was a remarkable. Uh, you, 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 you have read Andrea Jenkins, like, the I, only I, I person to to, to send in the to send in a letter demanding that uh, uh, Cameron stand down. The only person so far. It, it, <laughs> it was. I mean. You couldn't even find the verb most of the time. I was like, what does this sentence actually say? <laughs> also, 
Rather than it wasn't a resignation letter, was it? No, no of course not. It was it a was letter sucked. after being sacked, and that's not a type of letter, is it? It's not yeah. a genre. You it don't was get to a do really that. bad exit interview. Yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> it was a drunken three a.m. email to your ex. Yeah, it was an Alanis Morissette's first album. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you ought to know. Yeah. Matt, the new Health Secretary, Victoria Atkins, is pretty much unknown to the public, it's Mm. fair to say. She's got the still unresolved doctor strikes and an NHS winter to deal with. What do we know about her? Well, I have to say, up until today, I was with the public on this. Um, I didn't really know very much about her, but I've kind of um, looked her up and she's trained as a barrister. She's had various junior ministries. She seems to be someone that the opposition MPs respect as being someone who they can deal with and they can work with. Um, in contrast to many other ministers in this government. Um, She has type 1 diabetes and so has dealt with the health system from a very young age as a patient. So hopefully that will have some sort of um, impact on how she thinks about the health uh, service. According to the press, over the last couple of days, she's said to be taking an optimistic approach to bringing the strikes to an end. <laughs> and I love that, because that feels like something you just have to say. You couldn't be on like your first day as a new minister going, do you know what? Uh, this is fucked. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't, there's nothing we can do about this. Sorry, I don't know why I took this job. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm off. You know. Suck it up, losers who will die this winter. <laughs> but yes. there is there is a sort of big story that's already happened. Uh, sort of, uh, there's already sort of come into the news about the um, pretty big potential conflict of interest with her husband, who is the chief executive of a massive sugar firm. So as someone who might be involved in dealing with sugar taxes and talking about people cutting down on sugar, that sort of thing, she said she will uh, recuse herself from any decisions about that. And in a previous job as drugs minister, she also had to recuse herself from any decisions about cannabis because her husband is a busy man who also owns a medicinal cannabis site in Norfolk. So it feels like she's doing quite a clever job of just going to every ministry that he has some sort of interest in and then saying, no, no, I'm going to recuse myself from that. I, I love his conflict of interest thing where it, all it seems to be is you say you've got a conflict of interest, then carry on. Yeah, exactly. There's no sort of, I've got a conflict of interest, so I'm stepping back. It's no, I've like, told you there's a conflict. Yeah, it's fine. Just don't look at what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, That's, uh, yeah, yeah. Didn't, didn't like the former head of Vote Leave, isn't he also now in the cannabis business. I, 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 I don't I'm know. I'm pretty sure I read somewhere. Possibly. And that's not the only conflict of interest going on with the reshuffle. Uh, you'll be amazed to hear. Yep, Steve Barclay. Yep, versatile Steve Barclay, because he's a new DEFRA secretary. And it turns out he's married to a senior executive at Anglian Water. And Anglian Water is under investigation by Ofwat for dumping <laughs> raw sewage. Um, let's assume that he's not going to take any interest in water in his new job. What else will he have to deal with in it? I just wonder if every minister is going to recuse themselves. From the, like, How does this work? Do they then have to sort of go, well, I'll recuse myself from this, and then you can recuse yourself from that, and then I'll take your job, and then you say, you might have. They do a wife swap, <laughs> right? Okay. While they're in the role, it's like yeah. you, my, you're in health. You take my wife; she's into water. <laughs> yeah, that's how it goes. I'll have the, the sugar on the one. Table. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Put the chauffeur's key. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the first, the thing that really struck me about this move is just a sort of silly political thing, really. But it always strikes me that this was described as very much demotion that he was from mm. health to environment. As that's a big step down. As though, like, oh, yeah, the environment. Who cares about the environment? Yeah, exactly. Like, health's important, but the environment there, you know, fields. I, I guess perhaps they're thinking, well, at least rivers can't literally go on strike mm. um, in a way that, um, you know, has been very difficult for him to deal with. But apparently his opening remarks to DEFRA's staff have been reported. Someone said, why is the environment so important? He said, I have two dogs. I want them to have access to great landscapes. <laughs> Can I just be clear? He also has two children. But apparently, <laughs> apparently they're access to great landscapes. That's the British way, really. I mean, your dogs ultimately are more important than your children. It does feel like, yeah. They need for, to have nice landscapes to walk in. For, the, for, for, for a certain type of Tory voter, the environment is, where do I get to go to walk on a Saturday? And is the dog shit on my road? Those are the sort of the two <laughs> things. And that's it, really, in a way. Um, but it's a massive department, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, until the shelves are empty and then food security becomes quite a big part of the brief. Yeah, absolutely. Suddenly, and we are hearing noises, incidentally, from the cold chain um, federation 
that they're having massive problems this year again mm. because of Brexit, like getting stuff in for Christmas. Because they basically explained that because everything now takes two months, all the buyers have to make decisions about what they stock much, much earlier with a lot less mm. foresight of how business is going to be and how much they're going to need. And they err on the side of ordering less because they don't want to order loads of stuff that they throw away. And so empty shelves will now become just a regular feature mm. of the holidays. Oh. So jingle bells. Oh, I'm dreaming tonight. of an empty Christmas. <laughs> yeah. But it's a, yeah, it is a big department. There's food, and there's, there's food, farming there's subsidies, farm. there's, there's, you know, there's all this stuff. There's um, the dogs with the yeah. landscapes. The dogs with the landscapes and it's yeah. around him. Yeah. We've reached the end of the show. <laughs> so what are the stories that have gone under the radar this week? Matt, how about you? Um, well, I, I think there were two stories that seemed sort of linked, which I thought were kind of good news stories, I guess. Um, the chickenpox vaccine is going to be, um, hopefully, going to be suggested for all children in the UK, which feels like that's something that's been a long time coming. Um, yeah, there are so, many countries yeah. where they do that. I mean, the US has been doing it since 95, I think, um, and many other countries and uh, where they, they have the chickenpox vaccine as standard. So that's, I think, good news. And linked to that is um, the head of NHS England saying today that as a result of the HPV vaccine rollout and screening and various other things, they think that it would be possible to eliminate cervical cancer by 2040. And that's their sort of, not quite their pledge, but that's their ambition. Um, just shows that, you know, Medical science is moving in an amazingly quickly in lots of areas, and the vaccines are um, having a huge impact. And in a in a you know in a world where suddenly vaccine hesitancy has become more of a thing since COVID and stuff, I think this proves that this shows these are two stories that show that vaccines can make a huge difference. Yeah, my daughter got chickenpox, and after my daughter got chickenpox, I vaccinated my son yeah. uh, privately against chickenpox because it was just. You know, even if it's if it's not generally a super serious disease, it's so unpleasant. And it has all of the economic effects of people having to stay off work and all those yeah. things that we talked about before with with vaccines. So yeah, I think that's a yeah, positive story. Yeah, Alex, how about you? So um, Jonathan Reynolds, um, Shadow Business and Trade Secretary, um, did quite an extensive um, thing this week about the actual step by step plan to um, make trade with Europe easier, to sort of lubricate the system. And it's actually pretty fantastic. Really? It's genuinely like a sane adult thing going on. There's like bullet points, <laughs> there's <laughs> like data. Is it, is it based, dare I say it, on Best for Britain's report on this subject, which well, I read it, recently. It includes a, a hell of a lot of the recommendations, not all of would. them, because there were many, but a hell of a lot of the big ones, um, and then some, um, which actually many thought were beyond what was uh, politically palatable now. It really is a good slate, a good plan going forward. And I wanted to mention it in the under the radar um, section because I'm kind of delighted it's under the radar. <laughs> this is, you know, it's, if those things manage to stay in page six of the FT, it's all brilliant and we're going to <laughs> recover as a country. As long as they don't make it to the front page of the Express, basically, it's all good. So under the radar and long may it stay there. <laughs> Well, I read today that house prices have fallen, and you know how much they've fallen by? 0.1%. Oh! Yeah. Hello. That's after, that's after going up by 0.8% last month. So, you know. But it made me think, I mean, what would it actually take to make house prices fall in this country? Because clearly the interest rate rises and the massive increase in the cost of serv servicing a mortgage have not done that. And it would take massive amounts of house building. And we can't really kid ourselves any longer that monetary policy alone is going, mm. to, is going to sort out this problem. We need, we need more houses. Henry, how about you? Um, it's not a very uh, cheerful one, but six months of record surface temperatures on Earth um, and a heat wave in Brazil where the humidity is at 55 degrees <sighs> and um, a new 
Energy Secretary, I can't remember, is it the Energy Secretary? The new guy made a statement earlier saying that we've got to celebrate our petrochemical industries, the oil and gas guys who have been lying to us about this, this existential problem we've been facing this whole time. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just always there in the background and we, we pay it lip service and then it's impossible to focus on it all the time because it's such a dreadful mm. and overwhelming thing to think about, but it, nobody's grasping the nettle or doing what we need to do, um, which is stop drilling for new oil and gas. As or everyone's, as all the world's lead, on the one side, you've got the world's leading scientists and the International Energy Agency and the IPCC. Um, and on the other side, you've got people who just got their fingers crossed. <laughs> um, yeah, we need to do something about it ASAP. And that's the show. Thanks to Alex. My pleasure. Matt. Thank you. And Henry. Um, Dior. <laughs> Henry's new book, The Secret Royal, is out now for all your Republican relatives this Christmas. And don't forget, this is not a drill, a fantastic first episode on Trump's march to possible victory in the presidential election. There's a link in the show notes. Stay tuned for the extra bit after Demon is a Monster by Corner Shop and the traditional thank you to our army of generous supporters. You too could join them and get the podcast early and without ads, plus lots more. Search Oh God What Now Patreon to find out how to get yours. We'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.